Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Startup Studios podcast with Raj and Seth. How you doing, bro? You got wings, baby. You got right? wings. <laughs> and it's another it? beautiful day in paradise, so can't complain. I am super excited to introduce our next guest, uh, Kalsum Lakani, who, by way of introduction, is an amazing, well, startup accelerator and now VC in Pakistan. And I've had the pleasure of knowing Kulsum almost about eight to 10 years back when we were working on our own accelerator programs. But I'm sorry, he has a, <laughs> <laughs> she has a fantastic story, which I'm, I'm excited to get a dive into. So Kulsum, thank you so much for joining us. No, thanks for so much for having me, guys. Excellent. Excited. So before we get started, I'd love to introduce my boy, Raj Mawad. By way of introduction, can do it himself. <laughs> uh, appreciate it, guys. And, and Kasum, it's a pleasure. I can't wait to hear it all. I love the background. I have an eclectic one myself. was lucky enough to meet Seth not too long ago, but started in, in traditional banking. So started at Goldman, left energy investment banking, cobbled together a few shekels and, and built a hedge fund. Drew, built awesome. that to about a billion two. Yeah, we had an exit in 15 over 12 years to but peak AUM about a billion two. Major, it was just derivatives, a lot of an investment mm -hmm. shop, but we had some great compounding growth. Had an exit, became a dad. Passion, oh, you know, second life. Yeah, actually two times over. Oh, girl or girl or boy? Girl and boy? Both, both a boy and a girl. And I Amazing. think they're both mine. Yeah, and they're both mine, I think. So I'm like super excited. <laughs> My uh, husband was too really cute excited when he found out he was being a girl dad. He was like, he just got so pumped about becoming a girl dad. So. And it's just, I mean, not luck of the draw, but like a cousin boy. Okay, we can do this. Boy. Uh, all right. No way, boy. Okay, boy. I was like, you, you, do you get it? Are you done? So yeah, we're lucky. <laughs> I was done after I had one of each. So, Great. but you know, we moved to Seattle. Had had a second life. I always had a passion in health and wellness. Did a direct to consumer brick and mortar, and that turned into a SaaS solution. So, kind of got into the tech startup scene. I've gone through some accelerators, some incubators, who were VC back. So, pretty excited. That's awesome. Yeah, Seattle yeah. startup scene is so great too because it's like small and intimate, but also feels like there's just so much going on there. So I'll scratch that itch real quick. So Kalsun, that's brilliant. But now throw in someone who's a non-technical founder from Texas who comes during COVID <laughs> who has no network whatsoever. Right. So it, it's actually, it's a double-edged sword. It's extremely deep and close-knit, but it's But then hard to, yeah, hard to get into. <laughs> and that's great. I mean, I, I love, you know, as a female founder, I'll venture, I guess, an, an immigrant, you know, you understand the trials and tribulations and, and Seth has spoken volumes about you being the, the, the GP on the, on the VC side. So excited to get into it. Yeah. I'm no, excited to talk to you guys. That makes sense. So by just to kind of paint the picture about how Kosum and I first connected. So it's early 2000, like 11, 2012, I had my accelerator in San Jose and because of, you know, being Pakistani, I was always kind of on the lookout for local startup communities and, and stuff whenever I used to go visit. So Kalsum was one of those people who not only did we connect very early on, but then over the years, I've seen her stay consistent. And that's what I'm really excited about in terms of the story is because not only from somebody who shamelessly, uh, when I moved to Pakistan and started my own accelerator and the fund, I took a lot of inspiration and actually a lot of advice from Kulsum back when I was moving and, and first setting up. And then my my program and stuff didn't really work out. But seeing how Kulsum's I2I Invest to Innovate has expanded has been absolutely phenomenal to see. So Kulsum, thank you again so much for being here. And no, that thank being you for said, saying that. yeah, we'd, we'd love to just kind of dive in with who is Kulsum Lukan. That's a very <laughs> deep question to begin with. Where do I begin? Do you want me to start with where I'm from, I guess? However, however you like, if you want to start off way, way from the beginning, or we usually have a tendency to bring you back. Okay. Well, no, I mean, I guess who I am is, you know, lots of things to what Raj was saying. It's like, I've I think we all exist in multitudes and have many different lives to where we are today, but Work-wise, right now, I'm a, an investor. I've been a founder, and I still am a founder. I'm also, outside of that, 
now a new mom as of seven and a half weeks ago, but also, you know, someone who loves like film and television and like books and art and all these, I'm a deep, like creative, like adjacent person. And so, so all of those things and deeply curious. So I feel like I'm constantly dabbling and trying different and new things. And so, yeah, so for me personally, upbringing wise, I was sound totally American. So a lot of people don't realize that I didn't actually move here till I was 18 to the US, but I was born in Dubai. My mom is from Bangladesh. My dad is from Pakistan, which, you know, given the history of the two countries is kind of an interesting combination. And I have yet to meet someone from my generation who are Bangladeshi Pakistani because it was so soon after the war of 71, but my parents met and fell in love and that had us. And so I spent my childhood in Bangladesh and was there for elementary school and then went to Pakistan, moved to Pakistan when I was 11 for middle and high school. And so have an American accent because I went to international schools. So kind of have this weird third culture kid experience of having kind of been in many places where you are from places, but also not from there, or you never really feel like you belong in any place. So I think a lot of third culture kids, and that's the term that's used for this, you know, this combo TCKs, like we kind of can exist everywhere, but also no Nowhere. And so that's kind of our biggest strength, I think, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, when I moved to the U.S. for university and graduate school, I started my career in politics, which is why I moved to Washington, D.C., why I went to graduate school and then, you know, discovered a very nonlinear path to where I am today. So that's a little bit more about me, but happy to dig into that a little bit more. But yeah, I have kind of a weird background that kind of led me to where I am today. So I won. Why do you hang out with Seth? Like, honestly. <laughs> I actually Two, haven't seen Seth in a really long time. So thank God. Thank God. <laughs> <laughs> Two, Seth, like, put this on loop, just feedback loop for everybody. Three, what? The, who are you? So, like, I don't know, <clears throat> Seth, I don't know who I am. <laughs> no, it's so interesting because it, it's such an in conjunction and, and apropos of the conversations Seth had have all the time. Lebanese came during the war. Oh, great. Came to Texas. So I'm too brown to be Texan. Mm -hmm. Go home. I'm too Texan, too American to be Lebanese. Right. TCK. Like I've never heard of that. That is so apropos. That is so poignant. That's amazing. Because you know, I heard you say it's a it's a strength, and I agree. At the same time, it's imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome. Oh, for sure. 100%. And building a business in the country that you're from, but also don't seem like you're from is, again, biggest strength and also something that you're always kind of on the back foot about, but also kind of gives you the ability to, and maybe you felt this way, Seth, when you kind of came from outside in, being outside in helps a little bit, right? Because it gives you just a fresh perspective that you may not have otherwise, but but yeah, by the way, I went to Lebanon for the first time this past summer and it was, it's, it was, it's obviously going through a lot right now. And it's one of the most amazing places that I've ever visited. So, um, it is, so yeah. it is. but again, like you hit it again, you hit it. You, let's talk about not just the reality of, of the trials and tribulations you have to hit sprinkle in third world countries, think of it, you know, and, and well, it's a bit easier for you because you're a female. <laughs> I was like, for a second, I was like, is it? I'm like, no, definitely not. <laughs> Especially in, let's be honest, some male cultural dominated societies. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, even in the US, it's hard yeah. to be a woman yeah. and to be a general partner of a fund. Sorry, I didn't want to I didn't want to be disparaging towards American, so that's not at all. But yeah, totally. Yeah. Now the the TCK term, I've that's definitely the first time I've heard it. But you know, so being by, like so I had a kind of similar upbringing where I was uh, born in the U.S., lived here until I was eight. Then uh, my family moved to Pakistan, did high school, middle school, high school over there, then came back. And it was this this weird, we we call it ABCDs, right? Like American born confused. Asian. Yeah. And TCKs is a bit different, right? Because there's the immigrant experience, which that's that's the weirdest thing, right? Is that I moved here when I was 18 and everyone just assumed I was Pakistani American and I was I wasn't. And so their culture kids kind of exist in this weird box that are like, we went to international schools abroad. So we've traveled a ton and also have had a very American experience, but in a weird bubble outside of America. And so it's 
it's stuff that there's actually been books written about it, but I also find it really interesting. My husband's also a TCK, grew up mostly in Belgium, even though he's American. And so I, there's something about us that we attract each other because we're all a little weird and all a little bit of a misfit for where we are. And so, yeah. And the immigrant experience is definitely its own thing too, right? To exist in a place like Texas or to move back, move move to America and then move back to Pakistan, move back. It's like that in itself is like its own thing to unpack, right? And then the third culture kid experience from my perspective, at least, especially being half and half of two countries that were once at war with one another and once were once one country, those are things that were very defining for me and have been very defining in terms of my identity, but also what I've chosen to do in my life. So, so it's a very big part of what I talk about as well. But sorry, Chef, I got to do it. Let's double down then, because I always wonder if there's a dichotomy, right? And there's a shift of what do you truly assimilate with? I asked this to Seth, like, uh, what do you assimilate with? Like, I am, and where's home to you? Mm. I think home is here right now in DC. I, this is the longest I've lived anywhere in my life. Home is honestly where my husband, my now my daughter, and also my dog are honestly so home is where the heart is yeah it's wherever really they are culture. that's what i get from you <laughs> i mean put it on a blanket let's put it over the bed right? <laughs> and, I'm uh, <laughs> and i'm stitching yeah exactly no but i mean honestly that's what it is for me but also you know that sense of i feel interestingly even though i'm i don't look the weirdest thing about being half Bangladeshi and half Pakistani is i look Pakistani but don't feel fully Pakistani and then also i'm Bangladeshi but don't look Bangladeshi right so but i speak bangla fluently and i speak bangla with my mom and my sister and that i speak it better than i speak urdu right and so and even though i and i've dedicated my career to Pakistan and i was having this conversation with my sister the other day i was like you know the way that i've i've encapsulated those identities or the way I show up for it and the way I honor both of those identities is very different. For me, Pakistan is where I've spent my most formative years. My dad's still there. It's where, you know, home, I met the house I grew up in is still there. Obviously now I have a company and I've built a career there. So the way I've honored Pakistan is by, by dedicating my, my career and my, my work to that, right. My purpose has come from that. And then obviously I've done work in Bangladesh actually as well through, through the years of building in the startup space, but for Bangladesh, I've shown up more culturally, right. It's, it's this feeling of, of language and family. I'm very, very close to my mom's family. I come from a very matriarchal family of very badass, strong women. And so I very much closely I align myself with that. And so, you know, home is, is very, it's not something that is necessarily one place for me. And so, and also it's not one expression. It's the way that I've shown up in, in, in terms of how I honor those places, whether it's language or work or purpose. Well, there's, I think there's also a, su a hidden superpower for people like us where wherever we are kind of like a chameleon, right? You, you have to force yourself to fit in. Yeah. Um, and especially growing up as a, as a youngster in those cultures and then seeing the differences between who you are and what they want you to be, you kind of event, eventually end up having to convince yourself that be yourself wherever you are and make them fit around who who you are, right? I think that's a really great point. I've talked about this before with belonging, because I think you ha end up having so many identity crises when you're growing up, because you don't know, you don't really belong anywhere, right? And that as a kid is really hard, because you don't really have a sense of what anchors you. And then I think because you're so, you're a kid, I used to think that belonging was outside in, like people tell you that you belong or not, right? And then as I grew older and kind of became more comfortable in my own skin, belonging became very inside out. Like I was like, this is this is who I am. This is what this is what I hold to be true about myself, and and that's how, why or, or how I belong. So I've selected that this is how I show up and honor myself and, and those identities that are part of me, right? And I don't have to choose one over the other because I think I used to say when I was a teenager that I'm half Bangladeshi, half Pakistani. And I think when you say that, even as a kid, semantic wise, saying half and half makes you never feel like you're fully whole anything. So now I actually always say that I'm Bangladeshi and I'm Pakistani, or I say, I'm, you know, so you're fully one, you don't have to choose. And so, and then I'm also now officially an American, right? And I've been an American since actually the, unfortunately the election that Trump got elected, but that was my first election that I voted in. It was like very, 
very upset about that. But but that was my first U.S. presidential election that I that I was an American citizen voting. And now, you know, American is definitely part of my identity. American is, you know, my daughter now. So it's it's thinking about also to Raji you were saying you have two kids. It's like it's also thinking about legacy and, and what you're what you're building for that generation that you're that you're raising now after you. And, and that's the first time I've done a reaction costume. So like, I, <laughs> that's going to be a new thing, Seth. Fuck you. Sorry. That's going to be a new thing. Cause that was just my, oh yeah, we, yeah, I'm a knuckle dragger costume. We, I drop bombs that are four letters. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Me too. Cool. We're good. I think, I think there's one last part though. You do have two sides of a coin. Mm-hmm. Lebanese mom, Lebanese dad. Sprinkle on this last layer of of belonging, but disappointment, mm. generational disappointment. You got to marry Lebanese, blah, 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 blah. like Jesus, man, like no. Mm. <laughs> so you know you have to sprinkle that last piece on too. It's like, and I think you were talking about generations. Like you said, you would like to see a generation like you. Like it's not there. The war mm. was the war. Uh, you see what I'm trying to say? So like sprinkle on that one more, like like oh, Kals- maybe not Kalsu, but hey, Seth, like you got to be a little, you know, you got to be this. Hey, Raj, you got to be this. Like. I just generationally, I can't talk to you, mom and dad. I just can't, Mm. especially being in the States. Yeah. And especially expectations, especially for at least my friends who are all, (laughs) my friends who are next generation immigrants, right. As of these families, it's like they, they sacrifice, they felt this feeling of sacrifice. They sacrificed for you. So there is a sense of expectation and responsibility for you. Right. And so, yeah. And I mean, I was really lucky. My dad is an entrepreneur. He's a serial entrepreneur. So I kind of grew up in a household of, just being around through osmosis of of being in a business family, but also like being around my dad, who was genuinely a self-starter in so many ways as an entrepreneur, but also just his mindset. And so I grew up around that. So there wasn't a sense of you must do this, which I think was the biggest gift my parents could give us. And as a result, you know, my brother is building a web three company right now in New York. My sister's a journalist. I'm, you know, obviously doing this thing. And we have always had so much support from, from them as a result of that. It's huge, dude. That's so huge. Sorry for derailing the conversation, Seth. Because yeah. I, I'd also like to, like, in the future of the of the of the recording, I'd love to understand more about. So culturally, you honored one side, you know, business financially. I'd love to hear how that paradigm could have shifted. If you're like, man, I should have just started in the U.S. or you, you know, if when we get to that, because that's really interesting. Mm, yeah. Because I'm super keen to go home. I'm super keen to start a hub back home. I really am. I'm a, I'm a, you know, Seth and I work in now, but like mentor at Founders Institute for just the Levant group, which is me to North yeah. Africa, Algeria, Tunisia, Lebanon, Iran, Iraq. And I'm like, there's some brilliant, there's some brilliant, you know, from Seattle, we're, all we're catching now is not Silicon Valley, Silicon Slopes, mm-hmm. Salt Lake, Utah, they're coming up. Like all these guys, these pockets are coming up. And I think the Middle East mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it's super interesting, especially getting the experience that, that Seth had doing his VC over home. For sure. And I have a lot of friends who are Lebanese in in mostly in Dubai, but like are are building funds, are building startups. Yeah. There's so many amazing Lebanese and of, of descent and also people who are Lebanese, Lebanese that are building right now. So so actually let's let's take a, a switch to kind of the Sorry, so and... Could, yeah, and I don't want to, but it's just so funny. It's just like it's a dumpster fire right now over there. Mm-hmm. Uh, like last week I was talking to my dad. They're fighting on daylight savings. Christians and Muslims are fighting on daylight savings. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, when I was there. And Seth, was... that's not a metaphor for anything. Yeah. That's not like an anecdote for like, oh, what is like daylight? Sa-? Nope. Nope. So like the church, my dad's like, when's the church service? Like, well, today we're going to go by this time. Like by, by, by streets, by streets. Yeah. And the people that suffer are like the citizens. Right. And I think that was one thing I noticed when I was in Beirut. I mean, I had such an amazing time. I was there for my best friend's 40th birthday, but who, and he wanted to do it there because he wanted to bring tourism money into the country, right. A country that he lives in Dubai. Yeah. That's what he lives in Dubai. And he was like the Lebanon depends on tourism and it's one of his favorite places in the world. He was like, I'm taking, doing my 40th birthday, 35 people. We all went and 
were in Be- in Lebanon, not just in Beirut. And I remember thinking, I'm like, wow, I cannot complain about Pakistan right now because this is like the level of insanity when it comes to inflation or how people are, um, oh my God. are living or not living right now. And I, those are conversations that I had with, you know, people who are Uber drivers, people that I went to a farmer's market and conversations that I was having about the cost of goods. And so we went to the place where there was the, the blast that happened a few years ago. And in the port. there's just, mm-hmm, exactly. And I, I tried to do that because obviously like you're there and you're seeing all the fun parts of Beirut as well and and of Lebanon, but then at the same time, there's so much suffering. And so I was very mindful that I wanted to at least like understand that as much as I could. And it's, Um, it's, it's truly two way suffering. Sorry, Steph, I I have to shut up soon. It's two way suffering. (laughs) Like a perfect edit note again, it was my dad, you know, hyper, like it was, it's Seth, it's worse than Zimbabwe. It's worse than the Weimar Republic. It's the hyperinflation is insane. You can only take out X amount of dollars. My old man, he's he's in the grocery store and he like is walking around and he almost starts crying because he can't in good conscience buy the meat that's in his cart and take it home and eat it. He feels yeah. so bad because nobody else can afford it. He's the only one with meat in his cart. And he's like, I can't do it. He put mm-hmm. it back. Mm-hmm. He put it back. He can't afford it. He looks around. He knows he, nobody else can. Yeah. And there's just a really big gap. Like you can go to parts of Beirut and you would see like, you know, Rolls Royces and like things that are insane. And then you see people like I had a conversation, sorry. And I'll say this part before we move on, but I was having this Uber driver who it wasn't his Uber. It was someone he was driving for someone else because that's what it was the situation of his job was to Uber someone else's car for him. So he wasn't even getting the full Uber ride. And he was telling me he was part of the Lebanese army, but then he was explaining, he was explaining to these friends of ours that we were like his salary dropped overnight because the devaluation, right. And, mm-hmm. and things that happened to them. And like, now he's like, I can't even afford going to get a drink at a bar, right. Things that he would do on a regular basis. And he's like, now he's like literally making like a small fraction of what he used to just four or five months ago. And so you just, you think about that and it really sobers you to the fact that, you know, when we're about to, we're talking about Boxon as well today, it's Boxon is really bad right now. And yet there are places in the world that are truly like in a place where you would not have expected it to be. And I, I think that was for me, a big takeaway. I literally had come to Beirut from Pakistan on my way back. And I was coming being like, Oh God, it freaking like this happened and whatever. And then I got to Beirut and I was like, I have to take out like literally wads of cash. Like you can't, there's no credit cards that are working anymore. Right. And like, anyway, so we can move on, but it was, it's, it's very sobering what's happening. I, I, right I'm going to mute myself. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> no, but that's, that's awesome insight. I, I didn't realize uh, things were that bad in, in Lebanon. It's I mean, really obviously bad. speaking to Raj and about his family, but you know, it, it does kind of bec- the the perspective is pretty different because as people who have grown up in Pakistan, you know, and, as youngsters, and then going back and then reliving a lot of those issues as adults, you know that that's a that's a tremendous perspective that you know, that there are good things and bad things compared to the rest of the world. So, mm. Wow. But hey, I'd love to switch modes a little more towards the your upbringing. And you mentioned that your dad was also a serial entrepreneur. Like, yeah. what was he working on when you were growing up? And how did that really like, not only inspire you, but then also mold you at the beginning, like middle school, high school? Yeah, I mean, my dad, he started many different things. He had an advertising agency when we lived in Dubai. He he's always started. He start he can he's talked about failure a lot growing up, right? Like he would start something. I remember he lost all of our you know our family our family's money when he was you know he made his first million before he was thirty and then lost everything, right? And my mom would be like teaching aerobics classes in Dubai to keep the lights on, right? So when you kind of have that, you know, you've you've gotten a lot and then you've also lost a lot. I think it does sober and humble you, but also teaches you a lot about failure. Right. And, and I think that's the thing with a lot of our cultures, like, especially around entrepreneurship, failure oftentimes is seen as an end, not as like part of the journey. And I think I was really raised in an environment where failure was something that we talked about quite openly at the dinner table. Right. And my dad, that was one thing my dad did, but then he was in oil and gas. He did, you know, was part of a big, you know, gas discovery that happened in Bangladesh. He was in Pakistan. He was you know, working in that as well. And so he's done so many things. He did like, I think he had the first English radio station in Abu Dhabi. 
Bobby. Like he's just one of those people that when you meet him, he's extremely charismatic. He always has ideas. And so that was something that was very much part of how I grew up. I don't think I really had, to be honest, a very deep desire to go into business. I think my brother was very much like more like the wheeler dealer, like it was like, he was like, you know, selling, if he had like a ticket, he would sell that ticket and upsell it at like 10. Like that's my brother in a nutshell, right? He was like selling video game secrets on eBay to like kids that were too dumb to realize it wasn't actually a video game. And I remember this because he got himself kicked off of eBay for that. And then asked me very innocently on the phone. He's like, Hey, can I get your like eBay password or whatever? And I was like, yeah, sure. I had no idea what he was using. And then all of a sudden I was like, you've been kicked off of eBay. My brother got me kicked off of eBay too. This was back when eBay was used for those things, but, but that's kind of, you know, my brother. And then for me, I was never really interested in it. I was much more of a social justice warrior. I was, you know, my nickname when I was little was Lisa Simpson. I was very much about a cause all the time and very much about, wanting to write the injustices of the world. And so when I went to school and, you know, when I went to university, I immediately started doing politics and foreign policy. I was really interested in, you know, how, how like the world interacts with one another and, and just our place in it and, and what role we could have in actually changing that. And so that's what I went to graduate school for. I actually got my graduate degree in conflict resolution, which it's funny. I actually use it a lot now. So my partner, Miss Bo, always jokes that she's like, you actually, she has the MBA and she's like, she's like, you have a very useful degree for what we do, probably more useful than the MBA. Cause I use it all the time in negotiations. I use it for like, if I'm mediating amongst founders, it's like constant. Right. And so my graduate degree was in foreign policy, but that underlying conflict resolution degree has been something that has kind of taken me through interestingly what I do now, but, but I was always really interested in conflict and, and how, and why uh, countries go to war, but also how and why we can get along better and what are the roots of those problems. And that's always kind of what fascinated me. And what's interesting is that I kind of leverage a lot of those skill sets now, but that's really where I started my career. I started it in that space. And, and that's how, when I first started working, I worked in um, I, interestingly, defense contracting, which is the opposite of conflict resolution, but it was, you know, post the war in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's what, where jobs were at the time, you know, that that's where my career began and then kind of started to discover in a very nonlinear way, my path to where I am today. Where'd you go to for college? I went to university of Virginia. And also for undergrad? That's undergrad. Sorry. Undergrad, oh, sorry, I went to the University of Virginia. For grad school, I went to George Washington University. I went to the Elliott School, which is the foreign policy program here. Wahoo. Are you a Wahoo? No. <laughs> My next door neighbor, like nonstop. I'm like, what are you doing? So it's not Wahoo. It's Wahoo. Wahoo. Yeah. If you want to impress I, I want to get pissed. No, I wanted to piss him off. Wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, oh. that's where I went to school. All right. Awesome. And so tell us a little more about like, so after, after grad school, so I'm assuming uh, you went to grad school right after undergrad. I did. And then you were, you were in the defense industry. How long were you there? And then what, what was your mindset? Like, like was entrepreneurship even on the table? Was it like, mm, thinking no. about it? I was an analyst and I was there for about two years. They actually sent me out to Kabul at one point. And it's interesting. I just saw a friend's play recently where it was about Afghanistan and during that time. And I remember telling her after I was like, this was so accurate, like in terms of just the, just generally military occupation, not occupation, I guess it's very politicized to say that, but like just the military presence in Afghanistan. But, but I was working on that. And I was actually one of the main things that I would do as part of a defense contract that we had was I would write a, every day the U S military in Iraq would receive something that I would write, which was basically taking everything that the U S media was saying about Iraq. And I was distilling it for the U S military. I was like, this is what you need to know today. Um, so kind of like the daily, um, but I was doing that. And then I started to really despise my job. Like I hated like just everything about it. I was like, I, I, I went in there because I thought I was like, you know, as someone who is a Muslim in America, this is where my voice can actually, you know, this is where I could have influence. This is where, you know, this, they need to hear voices like mine in these, in these corridors. And then you're 24, 25 years old. And like, you realize when you get there that no one really cares about, you know, what I had to say, at least in, in that, in that 
in that corridor. And I felt really just disgruntled about it, but I was on a, a visa. Um, I wasn't a U.S. citizen, so I was working um, on a work visa there. And so I kind of felt stuck and just really couldn't get out of it for a while. And so while I was there, I ended up starting like, these are the moments that I think you have, like, where you're like, I can start, I can do something on my own that just kind of gives me that voice and that power back a little bit where I, at least I feel like I own something. And so by night I actually started a current affairs blog, which I guess would be the version of podcast today, but I started a current affairs blog on Pakistan, kind of using the same skill set that I did with the, with that daily brief that I wrote. I actually wrote, it was like a news site, but I would write about, here's what you need to know about Pakistan, right? And writing about it from the lens of an analyst, but also I was interviewing filmmakers and artists and change makers. And I was like, here are the things you don't read about in the news that you should know about Pakistan. And what was great about that was that, you know, I just started it. And similar to what you were saying, Seth, about just the consistency, that's actually probably my superpower is that I'm consistent to a fault, right? And even though no one was at the time early on in the blog was reading it, I would just write it every day, right? And I would just, here's what you need to know. This is what, this is, and I would write like funny stuff. I would have a funny voice about certain things, but also write and have great interviews with people today that I'm like, that I'm like, wow, I interviewed that person like 10, 15 years ago now, right? And now look at where they are. And that started to get traction because, you know, that consistency matters, right? People were reading it on a regular basis. And then I started to then speak on news outlets about Fox then. So I would be on the BBC or speak in Al Jazeera English, or I was writing, I wrote for the Washington Post about something. And I remember thinking, I was like, wow, this is like, cool. I have a voice that people, it's almost like the, the early creator days, right? Of like, you can actually be empowered to have a brand that's your own, that stands out outside of work. And during the day, my job shifted. Finally, I shifted into venture philanthropy, which was my parents had moved to the U S I kind of started to build our family office on, on philanthropy, but actually on taking more of a venture pro approach to philanthropy. Like how can we actually provide grants to social enterprises and even to early stage startups that can actually be quite catalytic for their growth at the time. And so that was something that I started to do. This was back in 20. 2009, maybe. So early on in the journey, started to explore that while I was writing this blog by night. And as I was writing this blog, I was like getting so much exposure to what was happening in Pakistan or what was not happening, right? I was writing about all these amazing people and meeting all these amazing people. And then by day, I, you know, I was trying to figure out, I was like, can we, can we give grants to these amazing, you know, a health tech social enterprise or something like that? And this was the early days. This is like startups weren't even a thing back then, right? And that's really what formed the seeds of Invest to Innovate to begin with, which was as I was starting to starting to meet all of these people and like meet people all over the world because I was traveling to these conferences. I was trying to learn about everything that I was doing. I was like, wow, there is so much potential that exists all over the world. And yet when you meet these people in these investor rooms or these giving rooms, everyone, if they're giving to emerging markets, they're only giving to like India, Mexico, and Kenya, right? That was, and to a certain degree, that's still the case today. And I was like, but what about at the time, Nigeria, what about Pakistan? What about places that those that potential still exists and no one's paying attention to it? Don't they deserve that same attention and that same support? And that's kind of the Lisa Simpson in me, right? It was like very much like, how do we write this injustice? How do we change the status quo? And how do we, how do we change the nar narrative here? just by su supporting the potential that already exists. And so that's really where Invest to Innovate came about and deciding to leave what I was doing. The blog stopped. I, I haven't written it since 2011 and actually kind of love that to this day, I still get people being like, remember when you wrote Jup? It was so great. I was like, wow, that was like, that is a deep cut 15 years ago. And actually one of our companies that we just invested in, Swag Kicks, I've known those guys for 10 years. And the reason I've known them for 10 years is because back in the day, they used to have a really cool comic book about these Karachi superheroes from Liari. And I wrote, I interviewed them for it. I wrote a piece about it for my blog. So that's how I met them first, have stayed in touch with them over the years. And we just invested in their company now called Swag Kicks, which is in the secondhand clothing space. Specifically started out with pre-love sneakers just the coolest guys, but like Mateen mentioned it to me the other day. He's like, man, you should, wouldn't it be cool if you wrote it about, wrote about this now on Chubb? And I was like, yeah, that's like super deep cut. But yeah, that's how Invest to Innovate was really started from was that, that place and that vision of like the next great innovators aren't coming from Silicon Valley. They're coming from places like ours, right? From Lebanon, from Pakistan, from Vietnam, from Nigeria. And Invest to Innovate was really started to say like, how can we support that potential? 
So just just random notes. So Mateen and I actually went to high school together. So no way! Yeah. Oh my gosh! Uh, FPS. Yeah. So I'm, he, I'm so he is happy. like a true hustler, man. Him, him, no, and Nofal and Hamza, like those guys are true hustlers, and I but, I love being an investor in in people like that. But that's the that's the game, and I I'm gonna be a super loser, and I get it. But it's like fuck, it's first world, mm-hmm. it's first world. Not like it matters, Dad. Solid gold Rolex. Goes home to Lebanon because he was a head of, you know, CEO of three hospitals here in Houston. Like savage, savage, world renowned brazers. Goes home. That motherfucker's like teaching me how to, and like not in the seventies, how to siphon water from our water, you know, the water silo of our next door neighbor because we're out. You're talking about a Pakistani kid who's probably hustling because he has to buy design. Totally, and that lends itself to be the most effective shrewd lean bootstrapped entrepreneur founder startup 100 percent. yeah it's why i believe that founders in our part of the world are the most resilient are the most like that you have that grit right which is something that is hard to find when you have everything like it's also the com- conversation about you know when people are truly privileged in some ways that's good it creates a safety net that some entrepreneurs really need but did it do they have the hunger right and we've seen it with both like we have a really good range within our portfolio of founders of different backgrounds but i always you know my i didn't when I when I I'm in a I'm from Islamabad in Pakistan, but my dad's from Karachi, and I always think that that Karachi grit is like very hard to come by in any other part of Pakistan. It's like it just there's something about it because it's like a big city that's sprawling where nothing works, and so for people to do things and get things done, you were automatically entrepreneurial, right? And yeah, and I mean, shout out to Mathine who you went to high school with, and those guys like they are. I always I always say that to them. I'm like, you guys represent to me like that true hustle. I mean, you kind of have to because so it's it's a huge city. It's it's extremely packed, and it's it's alive 24 seven. You know, I've been to New York, I've walked around the streets in New York, you know, at four or five in the morning, it's unlike anything you go to northern parts of Karachi. And there it like entire families are out on a Tuesday night, you know, mm-hmm. just randomly doing and all, all the stores are open, all the uh, the restaurants and stuff are open. It's unlike anything you've ever seen. But then even as somebody who so when I was growing up in Karachi, I grew up there from 94 to 2005 before I moved back. And that was a time when every other day there would be a strike happening. But then mm-hmm. your school is so like, hey, you, hey, you have to show up. Um, it was worse for college students. I know, like, uh, for example, IB and stuff, they don't care if there's a strike or if there's a, you know, something happened, you have to show up. But in our case, you know, there was always that, like, you know, our parents being a little overprotective and then us being, mm-hmm. you know, of, of a different, let's say, kind of background. They would always be like, hey, think twice about it, right? But Mm. if you're going to take that risk, make sure you understand why. And I think that Mm. really resonated or or has stuck through even in the entrepreneurship side, which is like you have to pick and choose your battles, but then also understand that whatever's going on externally, you can let it affect you or you can kind of roll through the punches and, and go along. Yeah, a hundred percent. And my, my partner missed us born and bred Karachi, right? So like I always, as much as like invest to innovate the company, the sister to the fund um, that I originally founded in 2011, the fund was only born in 2019 with MISPA. Um, but invest to innovate was is based in Islam, but it's just such a different vibe um, versus like, you know, out of our portfolio, I think the majority of our portfolio from the fund is Karachi entrepreneurs. And there's just some, I don't know, maybe it's just our bias because also Miss Buzz from Karachi. I'm Karachi adjacent in that, like, I love like everything about, I love Karachi. It's hard to live in. It's hard to be there. But I think as a professional city, it's one of the most exciting places in terms of things that you see there. And so, but yeah, the majority of our, of our portfolio with iDi Ventures is, is Karachi based companies. So I think that says something about us, maybe in our bias, but also maybe it says something about the founders there. So tell us a little more about, so you mentioned venture philanthropy, beginning, right? Or which you mentioned as being the early days of I2I. Like, no, it was before I die. So that okay. was when I was in, before I started Invest Innovate. Okay. So tell us a little more about the grants that you issued for your family fund. And then yeah. 
how did that branch into like what you're doing today? Yeah, I mean, I think that it gave me kind of exposure to, so we we did, we supported a few social enterprises in Fox Sun and then also did, my dad's a very big uh, person about interfaith, um, interfaith generally. And so we supported a couple of interfaith initiatives here in the U.S. as well. But the the ones that I kind of focused on were, you know, there was one in the health space, one in the solar space, which is actually how I met this, you know, founder who became part of our first accelerator program at, at Invest Innovate, right? And so I think it started to form kind of the the foundation of my network in Pakistan, because even though I grew up in Pakistan and I do have a strong network, a lot of my network that I have today with Invest Innovate or in iDi Ventures was built from the years that I spent there. And so, and less so because of my family and, and, you know, what my dad is and who he is and whatever, it was less about that and much more about this kind of grassroots network of founders that I was meeting. Right. And we were, I think we were donor to Acumen at the time. So I met a lot of Acumen box on investees back then. And so, so yeah, it just kind of helped me form network. It helped me perform, form a perspective. I think I very much, when I launched Invest Innovate though, I will say that I launched and then everything that I thought went out the window immediately, right? Like you just start something and you're like, wait, that doesn't actually work. And so you just start changing what you're doing. The accelerator, literally, we weren't started as an accelerator program. We were started as a company that would support companies. And then I was starting to meet all these founders and I'm like, they all have the same issues. We can't really grow consulting because number one, no one can pay us, but also like, but also it's like, why would I be just replicating the exact same thing? Why not create a community, right? And I think that's that's one thing I've always been on the side. I've always been a community builder, like just generally in terms of leadership positions that I've had voluntary or otherwise, I've always built community. And so invest innovate one thing, one big realization that I had in, we launched the first accelerator program in 2012, but I remember realizing very soon that it, we weren't in the business of building businesses. We were in the business of building community. And that's really what that program meant. And that really is what formed the foundation of, of that. And so, yeah. And I think a lot of people that I met through and are, are in the time when I was building our family office stuff formed to the first guinea pigs of our, our first accelerator program. They were literally people that I was like, I've never done this before. I have $6,000 in our bank account. We're just going to use it. Everything we got for free. Uh, Lums gave us space for free. Everything was for free. And I was like, let's just try to see how we can make this work. And then I think everything since then, because obviously that was back in 2012, ever since then, ever, I think our biggest strength was not just consistency, but was listening and learning every year and being like, how do we make this better? How, and really saying that the end the end goal was the founders. If we can provide value to them, then we're doing well. And so it was less about like what it looks like from the outside and, and all of that. And much more about like, is this actually providing value to the companies that are coming through this program? And so that's really how we've iterated the accelerator over the years. And now like our company, our, uh, the sister, so Invest Innovate, I'm no longer the CEO of it. I'm obviously still the founder, still fully now on the fund, but that Invest Innovate and the team there are building so many amazing programs that are doing stuff around the region now, not just Black Sun. And that's all been like iterative over time. We didn't jump to that. We just learned and and kept trying to address the problems that were in front of us. So tell us a little more about the early days of the accelerator, because you know the, the community aspect which you hit on is exactly how even startups in San Jose was started. It, I just started as a meetup group. Eventually it started like, and we were being from a fraternity and and being an alumnus, I used to get free access to the to the classrooms and to the auditoriums. And every two weeks, I would just invite people off LinkedIn and open it up to anybody who wanted to show up. And that was a huge aspect of uh, of just building not only a community of like minded people, but then also the support system around. It. And and Seth, before you and Kelsey, before you get into that, like I think there's a a piece that I found really interesting, and it kind of plays right in the community you're talking about stuff. And I think it's a dichotomy or just a, it's, a, it's a mindset that comes with certain areas because you talk quite a bit about grants. Candidly, in the, in the States, like the first thing you don't think of is grants. You're like, okay, who wants my, here's my ego. Who wants to invest in my company? Like that type of thing. But, you know, Chris, um, a really good friend of ours, Chris Chalesha, he's building out, he's in, but he's in Zambia. And he's mm. building out, you know, it's it's food security, it's water security. So he's doing a containerized, you know, um, it's a digital farmer's market and it's fucking awesome. But the first thing oh, he did, awesome. yeah, but the first thing he was like, grants, like, that's how you understand the government subsidizes. Like, how, like, it's such an interesting thought process of 
of how you approach funding and capital and, and really the, the value additive and accretive things that you could do as a startup. How did you see that, Kelsey, before you got to that community question for Seth? Because candidly, in the States, it's not, hey, grants. You know, that efficacy rate, like, should we think that way? Does it de-risk? Does it give you a little bit more vetted? Hey, listen, if you're applying for a grant, it's a 20-page fucking, hey, I got a blah, 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 Like, you really have to have a thought process. Not like, hey, VCs, check this out. I'm going to be $500 million next week. You want to do this? And like, you know, it seemed like then on the back end, have you seen, I hate to say, it, better hits? You know, are you getting on base more? Are you the company's really having some longevity? Yeah. I mean, this was back like what? 2012. This is 2009. Okay. So this was like what? How long ago? 14 years ago? 15 years ago? No, 14 years ago. And so the startup space then and everything was just so, I mean, I would say, no, we didn't have any hits. And I think that's why, but that's okay. I mean, I think that had I, had I invested money, my money would have been gone as well because it wouldn't have gone to anything. But I think a lot of times people who started that business, like could go on to like build something else. Right. And so there's value in it. I mean, because I was building it for our family giving, it wasn't like our, our, you know, the investing side of, Focus, you know, the for-profit yeah. commercial side of it. It was more about the fact that my dad always growing up was someone that always did charity. I was trying to do the next generation of that, which is like, let's not just do charity where you give away your money. Let's think about how we can create more impact with it. Right. And that's, that's what, what led me to do that. And obviously I did it only for about, about three and a half years, but, and I learned a lot about like that space, but, and I think there is value to it. I think that you are, you know, I still believe that even right now, especially in the work that we do with Invest Innovate on the sister side today, because there's so much uh, entrepreneurship support programs that they do early. I always say that, you know, don't raise investment if you don't have to, because you're giving away part of your company. Right. And I think grants really form a high risk, no return capital part of the value chain, which can be really important. The challenge with in the space now in Fox Sun especially is like when you have a lot of these development agencies that are giving grants, they're always tied to so many things that I actually think are not that are not integral or to the company being a commercial success. So it's more about like, you must be X company that does maternal health. And that company doesn't even do maternal health, but they, because there's so much scarcity of capital, they'll be like, well, I'll just change my business to do this. And then it's in service to the development agency and not to the business itself. And so I think when we were doing it in the family office context, it was really about like, we just want to support you and we want you to be part of that early part of your journey. I, it's funny now as a VC investor, because obviously it's the opposite of what that is, right? It's much more, you know, it's much more about like, what is, how am I going to get like a 20 X of this from when I come in today? Right. And how am I going to get, you know, I I've raised money from LPs. So how do I, how do I return money back to them? So it's a very different mindset, but I, 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 and I definitely think back then it was, you know, early in my journey. I think now it's interesting because, you know, to, sorry. And what was the question about invest innovate? What did the community look like back then? Okay, to lead that into that. So that was what I did in that side of it. And it gave me a lot of really good exposure. There weren't really hits back then, to be honest with you. And, and that's okay too. I learned a lot um, in that experience. Um, and that took me into when I started Invest Innovate because it was really about like, how do we just, first of all, it was just about how we support. Then I was like, okay, how do we keep the lights on and like support ourselves so we can support more companies doing this, right? And and so I think that, you know, early on in the journey with Invest Innovate, it really was about like when we built the accelerator program, it really started with community first. So one thing that we did over the years our accelerator evolved into becoming every year, six weekends over four months. So one thing that we learned was that it wasn't going to be a residential program. It wasn't going to be something that you move to a certain city to do because we didn't want to take people out of their operations. We're like, you're building in Lahore. Why would we make you move to Karachi for six months? This doesn't make any sense, right? So what we said was like, let's take you out for those weekends. Let's And the thing about doing it in six weekends in all of the major cities was that it gave them access to networks that they may not have. So one thing, Seth, you probably know is that a founder in Karachi very rarely has networks in Lahore unless they have family there. Um, those cities are like night and day. They're so dramatically different from each other. 
culturally as well, right? It's like you have the northern part of Punjabi part of the country, which is very different from like from being from Sindh. And so we wanted to give people access to those networks and access to those mentors. And then the other thing that we would do is it was really grounded in community building. Our very first weekend of the program, we actually started up as a as a retreat, just the community, just the startups and the founders. And we'd go up to the mountains and buck sun and just do a mountain retreat. And it was all about community building, vulnerability, leadership, getting to know them getting to know each other and kind of building this like trust with one another, because that was something that as a founder myself, I really, I looked for and what I needed. I was like, I need community around me because you need people, especially when everyone's telling you you're crazy. If you have a community around you, it's something that can really be very catalytic and supportive of you and your business. And that was something that was really, I think, unique in what we did and continue to do, right? Was that was one and that formed the grounding for the rest of the program, which was very rigorous on business, right? It was rigorous on like, you know, go to market, product development, customer, you know, customer feedback. Like there was so much of that we built and in, in, into it. So, so yeah, that, that was the program evolved a lot over time. And I would still say we iterated a lot. And now the Invest Innovate is actually about to relaunch, not the accelerator, but they're launching a new thing, a new program that is really focused on companies as they scale up. And it's really designed for what's needed today in the ecosystem and, and in the region. It's really mainly for companies that are really looking to grow to new markets, you know, really looking to scale with their, their businesses and also really looking to raise investment. And that's, and it's a little bit more ad hoc. It's, I'm, I'm really excited about what the team is building there. And I think that's been our strength always is never just take the business, the program and just drop it in. It's like always iterate, always change it, always listen to feedback from our founders, listen to what the market's telling you and build for that. And that's kind of what's taken us over the last 10 years. And a quick note for our viewers too, because so let's say if I2I had had this evolution, right? First as a community, then as an accelerator, now as a, as a fund and as, as all these other elements, how long did it take you for you to iterate or, or to add these components? I would say that it wasn't like, I didn't do it dramatically over, you know, it wasn't like one day we do this, when the next day we do that. I would say it was over the year, after a year, we would look at stuff or after six months, we look at things. So I would say that we brought in, we built out a research arm of our work, um, which kind of became the litmus for what, how people looked at the market. We produced a lot. We produced a lot of data on the startup space in Pakistan. That started in 2014. So three years after I started Invest Innovate, right? And what's interesting is that I have a, re I'm a researcher. My background is, was an analyst in defense contracting. Like that's what I, I know how to do. And it happened very accidentally. It was literally someone, uh, the World Bank actually coming to us in 2014 and saying like, hey, um, Colson, we want to just download the information in your head. Um, can you put it into a report? And that became the grounding of our insights arm, which is now the research arm of what we do. We produce a ton of you know stuff on sectors, on uh, startup funding, everything, right? And so, but that all started from there. And so I I, I love because now when you I think for a lot of people, and you guys have you know been founders. A lot of people love to look at your journey from the end and look backwards and it makes it seem like you meant to do all of those things and you and I never did, right? I always just said like, let's just build what's in front of us. And I'm very much someone that lives in the present. So I never was like in five years from now, this is what we're gonna look like. I, I had that ideal, but I was like, let's just build for what's changing around us. And so I would say that, you know, the insights arm really started to develop in 2014, but that also iterated as we listened to what people were telling us. And then the fund, which is a totally separate entity. People get it confused all the time for Invest Innovate and iDive Ventures, totally separate. But that came about again, because I was in a, I was in a room having coffee with people, you know, at one of these big, you know, corridors of power. And they were like, why don't you invest? Like you're not investing money. And I was like, well, you know, we're just building these programs. And I was like, I'm not an investor. I was like, I, I don't have an MBA. I don't have a finance background. And they're like, yeah, but your background is actually more interesting because you have a different vantage point. You're someone that's been supporting startups for so long. You are, you've been a founder yourself. And I realized that that was that I had that imposter syndrome, but someone kind of putting it in my ear was the reason that formed the grounding of IDI Ventures, which is the fund. And actually my partner, Mispa, has more of a finance background. 
comes more, more, more linearly and still not linear into this space. But like, you know, she worked at Citibank. She was, you know, worked at, she was one of the, she was a second hire at Acumen and Fox then, which is an impact investor and it has kind of that grounding. And so we balance each other out really, really well. And she's someone that I really needed to build this. I was a solo founder with, you know, the original company Invest to Innovate for so long. And I knew what the fund, when we were starting it, I was like, I can't do this on my own. And also me on my own is not enough to build this. Right. And so she brought so many complementary skill sets um, to me, but also our early team or, you know, us, shout out to us that Joffrey also came from straight investment background. And so kind of built the rigor that we needed for the fund, but but, but, you know, that fund started out and spun off on its own in 2019. So they're, they're two sister companies. We have a symbiotic relationship with each other, but we are not connected to one another, legally speaking. And also we're not, we are connected in terms of we share information. We've invested in companies that have come through some of our programs, but we're not necessarily tied to one another in that way, which in some ways is, makes it really healthy, the relationship. How many founders have gone through the, the I2I programs? So, so the accelerator, and then since then we've run like numbers of programs with the World Bank, with Facebook, with a number of different players. So all together, I want to say over 250 companies have gone through. I have to check that because I just wrote that number down and I'm like, we have it written on our website. Um, I think we've had about, yeah, about 250 to 300 altogether that have gone through some variation of a program that we've run through the accelerator program because we stopped running it. We paused it during the pandemic and they're now bringing it back as this new iteration. Um, we had about 50 companies through that. And yeah, about, yeah, we've trained, we've trained to over 250 startups and about over 45 incubators and accelerators as well. So we kind of became, what was cool was that as we started to build, this was one way that we, we generated revenue is that as we started to build, we kind of became the go-to of how do you build a good incubator and accelerator in a market like this, right? And I remember with the first program that we ever helped build outside of Boxon was in Bangladesh very poetically because I had friends that were there and they were like, Hey, what you're doing there, we want to build here. Can you come and help us build it? Right. And that was the very first program that we, we helped support and design, but we've, we've supported programs now in like Vietnam, Cambodia, Bangladesh, Nepal, throughout the Middle East. And so that that's now about 45 incubators and accelerators that our, our team is trained. Now that's, that's a phenomenal network. And considering how it, it's so relative, it's, built all this in a very short period of time. That's a huge testament to you and your team. Um, yeah, I think it's been like a lifetime, but yeah, <laughs> 10 years. And Sorry, then I, can I be terrible? No, please. So you've gone on this journey and I've been listening and it's epic, but something stood out and it stands out to me on a daily basis. And I'm sure to Seth as well. Your mission, your vision being being like, who you are, your why. Again, we can get romantic and cliche, whatever it is. You mentioned in the beginning, you know, you've seen a lot of people pivot for the money. We were, you know, we're a digital health solution. They're like, no, you're not. You have a bunch of doors. Like you're prop tech, go to prop tech. But then you take prop tech money and prop tech money goes, actually, here's our narrative. Here's our board seat. And you were fighting that. And then I heard, I need to make a 20X on my money. Well, that's, yeah, the venture side of it. Yeah. That's my point. You, nobody else, you, how did you deal with it? Like that's, that's, <laughs> that's a huge chasm to cross of like, let's go it's founders, let's go LPs. Shift. Absolutely. And it's how did you, shift. are you okay with it? Because you came from the, let's do this together to, because I, and it's brutal. And I'll tell you, I'll add one more piece of nuance just to piss you off. Yeah, make as much money as you can to then help as many people as you can. 100%. I believe that. I believe that, truly. But where's that dirtiness of like, okay, Elon Musk, I know I'm kidding, but like at what point? No. Like and this isn't, this isn't a terrible question at all, right? Because this is definitely, I mean, I have very open discussions about this. Like I saw venture capital is a dirty word for the longest time, right? I was like, I just saw, and you see this even, you know, when you look at like, Theranos and you look at like WeWork and you look at companies where, you know, that type of herd mentality 
is, is something that is, you know, and, and venture generally is also extractive. So beyond the fact that venture runs to the shiniest new toy on the other side of it, you see that companies can get completely broken by venture, right? Because it's extractive by nature. They need to see certain returns. So you see companies that end up literally just like buckling and breaking as a result of that. And I had this conversation with myself personally a lot because I was like, do I want to do this? Like, is this that's the as like, did you, could you do it yourself or did you like? Yeah, it was definitely, it was, and I think that's a great question because that was definitely like a conversation I had with myself because I was like, you know, this is something that I don't fully like prescribed to. I was like subscribed to in terms of like, you know, I see all the bad that venture has done. And then also at the same time, what's kind of interesting now is that I'm, I've met so many amazing venture investors that are genuinely like with some of the coolest, most interesting people that are funding some of the best innovations in the world. Right. And so while I totally agree with you, I think that venture capital by nature is extractive. Like I will, I'm getting, I am putting money into your company in order to extract that money out and give it back to other people. I think that's, you can still kind of create your lane within that, right? And so this is what I've discovered. And and Miss Ben, my part, my I literally am in my partner, Miss Ba, she's my work wife. Two, the only two women building a VC fund, by the way, for Box Sun, right? But like her and I have this discussion all the time. And I think sometimes our team is like, well, there's like, we have real discourse and conversations, right? It's like when in front of our team where we're like, is this the company that we want to back? Is this actually creating real value in the world, right? And I think we're not impact investors. We are a commercial fund. But if you look at every single one of the companies in our portfolio, I was actually just posted about this on LinkedIn yesterday. One of our companies, Deal Cart, is in the grocery space, but not quick commerce. It's like the opposite of quick commerce. It's really focused on price conscious users. It's on group buying. So kind of like a gamified Costco, right? Of like in an environment like this in Pakistan where everyone is trying to save, this is a company that is actually, you know, gamified it and doing it in a scalable way, right? And doing it in a way that's like commercial, like they actually, and also in focus on bottom line, because they actually were contribution margin positive, like their CM2 was positive as of March, right? And which is, those are the founders that did that, but they're creating enormous impact, right? And so that's what your VC dollars can also do. It's like, it can actually bring catalytic growth to companies. And I think in Pakistan, this is a much bigger conversation, but I, I do think that like VC, the VC, the approach that we're doing or trying to do, number one is making sure that you take money from people that align with you, right? Like know that like, yes, we are going to bring you commercial returns. We believe that um, if you want to back a fund that's going to bring exits, like back us for sure. But number two, it's like, we're not going to back a company that is going to be bad for the world, right? We're not going to back and do, and if you look at how we, how we work with our founders, so much of the DNA of building a building an accelerator in a community for so long bleeds into how we operate as investors. We really dig in when it comes to the value that we provide to our companies post investment, right? Like we talk to them as humans. We don't say like, you must show us X, Y, Z projection. It's more about saying like, you know, who are you? What do you do? And how can we kind of dig in and help you build that? And I think that's one thing that you know, and I don't want to say that for ourselves, but that's actually one thing unanimously our founders talk about about us is like we are one, we always strive to be the most founder driven investors. Um, but, and I don't just say that lightly, that is something that our companies say about us. And I feel really, really proud about that. And so to the point of what you were saying, Raj, is like you could be, you could be a VC business as usual, but we never got into VC to be business as usual. We got into say like, how can we, how can we Trojan horse disrupt the shit out of this and actually like be a, be a fund and be investors that actually build things that matter and invest in things that matter, but do so in a way that actually lifts everybody up. And so that's, you know, we're not impact in that way. And I think people sometimes see women, sometimes they see, you know, the fact, the way that I talk about what I've done before and they're like, oh, she's soft. And I'm like, actually the best secret sauce that I have is, is what I've done before. And the lens that I bring to the table, it makes me a better investor. Um, it makes me pick the right founders. And so, yeah, that's, that's us. And I, I think it's a, it's a conversation that I've definitely had many times with myself and things that have kept me up at night. I'm like, am I making the right calls here? Is this the right path to take? And that's honestly still TBD. Like this is a chapter in my life that 
will hopefully be be around for a while, but I may, may close this chapter at some point, like down the road and like, you know, seven, eight years post fund two, post fund three, and be like, I want to go just be an angel investor and just invest in companies that where I don't have to respond or, or answer to any other LPs. Right. So who knows? No, it's just because it's a self-serving and selfish question because it really is kind of how I and Seth want to build startup studios. It's like, mm -hmm. there's a disruption. There is, there's, there's a way to add value. There's a way to be commercial, but you don't have to be a, like, so for all of our listeners right now, here's a perfect example. You don't have to be a douche. Yeah. You don't, you don't yeah. have to be a douche. We have a no douche policy <laughs> at Adventure. Are you hiring? Are you hiring? <laughs> I'm not saying you I could what's... be hire a bull, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because Miss Bun, I actually say like when, you know, people ask us like, if we were to say really off the record, like, what do all your founders have in, in common? I'm like, they're not douchebags. Like, they're not assholes. We didn't invest in assholes, right? And a lot of VC does because they're like, we want someone who's aggressive and someone, and you can be aggressive about what you're building and not be a douchebag about it, right? What? Like, yeah. What? <laughs> Mind blowing, right? That's great, girl. You're so great. Raja has automatically disliked. Like, yeah, I'm out. Super douche out. asshole. Yeah. I'm out. <laughs> Is that like one of your due dealers' question? Are you a douchebag? <laughs> Sorry, Seth. Yeah, I, I, this is exactly how you wanted it to go, right? Yeah. yeah. Hey. No, well, uh, I love this I, conversation. We you're too up. smart. But that's the thing. I think that's what's beautiful. It's it's like there's. I would love people to just resonate in this and just soak it all up because especially because you said like people think I'm soft. Like that's a super fuck. Yes, it is. People think I'm a troglodyte knuckle dragger. Great. I'm eviscerating them on the back end when they're not noticing. Yeah, I love it. Like I think it's great when people underestimate you and or put you in a box for something yep. that you're not right. And I am a big believer. I said this in the beginning, it's like, we exist in multitudes. Like I can be like a million things and you may want to just put me into one box or you might want to doubt me, but you know, I've proven over the last 10 years that that's not the case. And again, that's unfortunately pretty problematic for a lot because it's like, oh, you're not, you know, generationally, I'm a corporate man or woman. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, now you're frenetic. Now you have ADHD. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Kyle, so you're like you, you you're jumping all over the place. Yeah. No, no I'm not. I, know I mean, what imagine, I'm doing. yeah. And imagine becoming a mom, right? It's like for women, at, like women in power or women in leadership that then become moms, all of a sudden, everyone wants to just be like, someone literally said to me, like when I was pregnant, he was like, oh, sorry, is work going to take a back seat now? And I, <laughs> I literally just looked at him and I was like, and I, this was at a dinner, right? So it was like in front of other people, but I had no, I was like, I'm just not going to say it. I was like, would you say that to a man? And he was like, and everyone was like, like, oh my God, this is really uncomfortable. And he was like, you know, I, I would, I'm like, no, you wouldn't, you would not say that. Was, <laughs> <laughs> but you. also, yeah, basically like a, a big fuck you, but also like, a lot, like the problem with why so many women end up bowing out of being in positions of power by leading things and doing things is because we've been told that you can only be in one box. And I think that's complete bullshit. And, and it was really important to me that when I was pregnant, I was speaking on panels. I wanted women in Pakistan in the audience to see that, right? I was like, it is important to say that you do not have to take a back seat. You do not have to leave your seat at the table just because you're making a decision to do something. And it's not an either or scenario. And I find it even more important now that I'm the mother to a, a little girl that I want her to see that this is the way her mom is going to be in the world. So, Absolutely. so that she never, she has that to look up to. Oh, that's a, that's phenomenal uh, insight. Go ahead. Tell us a little more. So starting a fund in Pakistan, right? And as somebody who's gone through it with Planet N. Yeah. With Planet N, we had other, you know, obviously Nadim, his background, his superpower coming from finance. It was basically, I, I hacked my way into VC, right? Okay. Right. But I've seen you on the ground. I've seen you hustle in Pakistan, abroad, dealing with different LPs. Like, kind of walk us through some of the early challenges of the fund or of raising. And then what what's the ethos? Like, because I, I do, and you you alluded to this a little earlier, but I2I Ventures operates and has core values, which are very different than most VCs even consider. Really? And I'd love to understand like that, not only the thought process behind it, but then also the journey from start to like first fund, I guess. 
Yeah, I mean, we just, we started with kind of a proto, like a fun zero, because I think the hard thing was, is that all of us in Pakistan that are operating, all my fellow, our fellow VCs, right? Like, and, you know, friends with all of them, they're all like, we've been co-invested together. Um, it is really, first of all, you're dealing with Pakistan, which is an unproven market. Number two, we were first time fund managers with very little experience, no experience in venture capital. And so everyone that we would, if we pitched for funding and people were like, why should we invest in you? And where is the, where's the end game here? Right. Cause no one, it's a question mark for everybody. So what we, what we started with was a fund zero, what we call fund zero was that we've had a facility where we warehoused our first deals, right? To show track record. We're like, let's just, in, let's start investing and putting money out the door. We had a lot of early believers in us, including the Dutch Good Growth Fund, which is a fund of funds for frontier markets. They were amazing and, and anchored that facility that then we matched with other early LPs that came into that. That allowed us to do our first eight deals. So then when we opened our doors in 2019, we started investing and we would just like raise and invest, raise and invest, right? We're like, let's just like, we just went to work. And I think that's misfun me in a nutshell, right? It's like, it is extremely hard to raise a fund. It is extremely hard to do it as women, let me tell you, and extremely hard to do it for Pakistan. And so Ms. Ben and I were like, we don't have, we don't have the luxury of making, of basically fucking up, right? There's no luxury here. Like we are, if we, if we mess up, as women, the only women general partners in the country, people are going to look to us and be like, well, look what happens when you give women money. Right. And so we were like, there was a lot of pressure and there still is a ton of pressure on us to like perform. And so what we just did was like, every time we, we would just invest and we had that warehouse of those eight companies, they include some of the best performing companies in our portfolio, including Abhi, which is in the earned wage access space, you know, raised a really big series a last year doing really well. They've grown out of Bangladesh into the, into the the Middle East, Credit Book, which was Tiger Global's first check into Pakistan and um, digitizing, monetizing and, and digitizing Katha's in Pakistan, phenomenal founders. You know, we have a ton in that space, in that warehouse. And then we, what we did was that we leveraged that track record to then start raising for our first close of the first fund. And that was we set up in Delaware, but that's been open since March of last year. And we're still raising and closing currently the fund right now. The warehouse is actually being pulled up into the fund. So everything is like all together in one entity, but we kind of think of it as two phases, right? So phase one was build a track record, show, show and prove that we can do it. And then phase two has been like fund one of, 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 of building this Delaware entity and, and investing in Pakistan and everything is kind of in one and is kind of be, be becoming one thing, but it kind of helps people to understand that. So they understand kind of why the journey has been this long for fund one, but also how much we've learned. Right. And I think what's been hard and interesting is that we've never, timing has not been on our side. So we raised We've been raising and then the pandemic hit. We were raising and then Pakistan went to shit. And we're like, great. We had our first close. It was oversubscribed. We were like on a roll. And then all of a sudden, macro took a, a nosedive everywhere in the world, right? And so right now we're in the middle of trying to close the fund. And, and that's, we're dealing with the perception issue of Pakistan going, you know, our economy is in a free fall right now, right? And so one thing I always talk about is that, you know, in a lot of ways, that's actually even more of an opportunity for early stage investors than it was in 2020 when Pakistan was, you know, there was so much capital that went into the market. We still got into the most competitive deals, but those deals were like insane, like oversubscribed with like all these outside investors. And now it's like much better for us in some ways, because it's a lot less competitive prices are going down, but it still makes it difficult when you have to argue about Pakistan as a market, because, you know, obviously from an, a macro standpoint, from political instability, that those are all the things that were always the case before. We just happened to have a really good year in 2021 that brought in a lot of additional capital outside. No, oh, that's uh, um, even, even from a capital raising standpoint. So is were you able to raise a lot of your money locally or did you have to bank on uh, outside like Pakistani Americans or, or immigrants? Yeah. 
what I always talk about, and I've written about this a lot in our in our research reports about Pakistan's startup space, is that the current fund regulations, as you probably know, Seth, it doesn't really, it's very onerous for, for funds, small funds, especially to set up in Pakistan. To set up is not hard, but to actually run your fund, it's quite onerous, right? And and so most of us, some of us now with our fund twos are, are setting up vehicles in Pakistan as well. But for the most part, all of us set up outside of Pakistan because of that. Then the challenge that then happens is that you leverage that local money is really difficult because getting money out of Pakistan is really hard. So most of us then had to raise outside of Pakistan, mostly from the diaspora, which meant that we were all competing with each other for money, which doesn't really lend itself to collaboration because you're like fighting it out in like these rooms of like, why should I give you money and not this fund money? And so I think it's it's made it hard, but I think we a lot of us do our best to still collaborate and to still kind of keep things quite cooperative, even if we're kind of duking it out for who gets checks from who else. From from who, right? So, but yeah, it's it's difficult to raise money from inside Pakistan if those people don't have money outside already. So, so you're then fighting for a smaller chunk of the pie for your funds. Yeah, no, we were we were a little different in the sense that so Planet N we raised entirely from locally, you, which you guys was were set up locally too. Yeah, yeah, we we were so different setup, and I know Nadim has been working very closely with the SECP on the VC laws, and it's a mess even now, like. Yeah, you know, if and Raj had actually asked me when we we first met, like, hey, would you ever want to become a GP again? And I was like, I'm never going to make that mistake where being, you know, Pakistani American, I will always say do what's best for the fun, which, you know, uh, with my access, with my advantage is to be a Delaware or um, you know, sure. set it up here and then funnel money back. Because yeah. then it, it's interesting because the gar- the local government actually supports you more than if you try to set something up locally. Yeah, I mean, there's a... Yeah, and, and Nadim is part of it. I mean, we're all a, a bunch of the Pakistan focused funds. We're all founding members of the Venture Capital Association of Pakistan. We're all trying to now together lobby and advocate for changes to all of that. So hopefully that changes in the future. But but yeah, for right now, it, it is it's difficult, right? And and so in setting up in Delaware as an example, you just get an access to an ecosystem of resources in 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 the U.S. And whether it's tax like your tax advisors, whether it's you know CARTA for your fund administration, like there's just a really established ecosystem here for running a fund that you don't have you know, there. And then, you know, obviously people are, you know, some of our colleagues are set up in, in Mauritius or wherever. And like, you have similar Singapore, like you have similar stuff in those markets as well, but being an American now and being based here, um, having a U.S. based fund is, is definitely an advantage. And another, I think a hidden advantage of being a, a U.S. based entity, especially working in the startup ecosystem is all the startup partnerships that you can get. Um, oh yeah, mm-hmm, for sure. Uh, for us, so at 10XC, we partnered with like Facebook, AWS, Google, but because they were local or they had local operations. Otherwise, when I was over here, when we didn't have the fund, uh, it was the accelerator program. We were we just had space. Every single one of these people wanted to work with us because you know, mm-hmm. it, it was just a different signal. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure even I2I, uh, especially now with the restructure, should be able to take advantage of, of mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, Tell us a little more about like the the investment ethos. This is something which a lot of people ask as GPs, especially. Yeah. And and has that ethos from day one stayed the same, or have you also had to evolve that as you've gone along? It hasn't really evolved. I would say that our our ethos is really that we invest in bold founders solving Pakistan's largest problems, right? Which sounds pretty vague, but it does mean a lot to us, right? Because First of all, it's focused on the founders. We invest at pre-seed and seed stage. So really all you have to go on at that point is, is founders and, and their and who they are. Solving Foxon's largest problems is a big part of this because number one, it is, you know, it is creating that value, but also that's really where the market opportunities are, right? So we're not looking for niche businesses. We're not looking for someone who's building something pretty small, but like people that are disrupting the trucking space, right? Where investors in truck it in, people that are in the last mile logistics, we're investors in in, in Rider. Um, we invested in an electric uh, vehicle mobility play called, you know, Easy Bike. Um, and those are all things that, you know, when you look, when you back it up, it's like they solve their part of that same statement. And the founders, when you meet them, there's something that's a really interesting 
interesting thread amongst all of our founders when they meet each other. We're like, I think maybe it's also a mirroring thing that as GPs, Ms. Ben, I look for the non-douchebags, but also like we look for people that we believe are the right founders to, to, to build things. And so, yeah, that our, our whole thesis is that we believe, you know, Pakistan is, it is the fifth largest market in the world or fifth largest country population wise in the world. It is coming up in terms of connectivity, in terms of consumption, all of those things. And we believe that as early stage investors, now is the time to invest, right? That's, that's what you do. And then our ethos underneath that is, is what I just mentioned, the bold founders solving those largest problems. And when you look at our portfolio, every single one of those companies fits that. So yeah, it hasn't really evolved. I think we've pretty much stuck to it. And if anything, it creates a good discourse between me and Ms. Ben amongst our team, because we definitely have a debate constantly when we're looking at a deal. It's it's asking those questions, right? But I, I think that every we always have 110% conviction in every deal that we've invested in so far. And we've done 13 companies. Yeah, 13 companies in three years is that's yeah. a good, good rate. So as somebody who's worked or, or has been a part of different ecosystems and seen how things are happening in different countries and different markets, like how has, it, are, are there patterns that you've seen from your experience or, or from working with all these different kinds of people that you see as being uniform across ecosystems across founders? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I'm kind of obsessive. Like the thing I'm probably the most interested in is the similarities amongst ecosystems. Like I really find emerging markets to be quite similar to each other. Like you'd see the problems that are happening in Jakarta to be quite similar to the problems happening in Cairo to, you know, to Karachi, right? To Dhaka. And so I, as a result of those problems being quite similar, you end up seeing the trajectory of those ecosystems also being quite similar, right? So you end up seeing the very first amounts of capital that go into a lot of the startups that come up are oftentimes disrupting very uh, sectors that are, 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 that are kind of in the spaces of consumption, right? So e-commerce, fintech, logistics, they all kind of feed off one another. That tends to be what you see first. Um, And it just depends a little bit in terms of the, the blueprint of those ecosystems depend a little bit different or a bit different based on policies of what those markets look like, right? So in Pakistan, as an example, the fintech space didn't really take off until the policies changed to allow the regulatory environment improved to allow for fintech to really take off. But if you look at like Indonesia, you look at those places, um, very similar blueprints. In terms of founders, I find them to be all very similar to each other. Like you end up meeting a founder, like we, and actually what was happening a lot in 2021 is that you would see like a founder of a B2B startup in Indonesia, um, that was, you know, built and and in Pakistan, they were building the same thing. So we saw a lot of that type of similarity happening. And then also the founders that would be building were all quite similar to each other as well in terms of personality. So yeah, I don't know if that answers your questions or there was like background. (laughs) And so I was getting a bit distracted. No. And Tell us a little more about the the inner workings as a GP, right? I'm sure you have to go through a lot of ups and downs. You get very tough phone calls from your founders or, or the portfolio companies or maybe even LPs. As as a, you you mentioned, as a first time uh, co GP, like what are some ways that you kind of have trained yourself to to handle these situations? Which situations? A negative situation that comes up from either a a portfolio company sharing Mm. bad news or maybe it's an LPU saying, hey, the market sucks right now, so I'm (laughs) pulling out my commitment. Were you part of my day today already? (laughs) (laughs) I think, you know, you just kind of come at everything with a little bit of empathy, first of all. Like right now in the current environment, you're like everyone's dealing with shit. Like if you're a GP, like your LPs are also dealing with the, you know, the blowback of what's happening in the markets right now. So I, as much as we demand empathy from them, they would also demand that of us. I would say that with our founders as well, right? Like I think the biggest um, the biggest thing you can come at stuff with with investors is like 
just understanding where they're coming from, right? Like, I think it's very much like, can we drop in and just listen to what's going on here? And every time one of our companies has had a challenge, that's what we do. Like I, we, what I really love, and I think I feel really proud of is that we typically are the 11th hour investors. We're the ones that people go to when they need help on something. Right. And so as an example, posts, you know, the economy start starting to become kind of tricky last year, in the spring of last year, when everything started to go down, we started to see layoffs happen. That's when Airlift announced their first layoff, Swivel, all of that. Truck it in, one of our companies, which is in, you know, disrupting the trucking space in Boxon. Three of the best founders I've worked with, period. Like, honestly, those guys are just bar none. Like, shout out to them. They're amazing. But Sarma and Reza and Heather all like, they messaged us. They're like, hey, we're about to, we're going to right size the company, not downsize. They're like, this is actually, we have r- runway for 12 months but we want to get runway to 24 months because we're just being mindful of the fact that we need to like improve our margins. We need to like focus on the right things, but we also need to give ourselves the breathing room to be able to do that, right? In case, in case things don't get better. And, you know, um, they had a great crystal ball for what happened because things have not gotten better, right? But what they were saying were like, we want to communicate this properly, not only to our teams, but also to the outside world. And the the investors that they reached out to to help them were me and Mispa, right? And Mispa and I got on the phone with them. We looked at their comms. We um, advised them on what was going on, but we also were checking in with them because the next day was going to be a really rough day. It's not easy to let go of people on your team, right? So we were like, how's, you know, we were asking them like how they, how they were feeling beyond just like, how did it go? And that's something that, you know, I think speaks to us in so many situations. Like if there's been a founder, uh, issue amongst founders. Like we'll dive in and help mediate. Like we'll talk to, you know, we'll talk to investors on their behalf constantly. Right. And other investors that are already in the round, right. Like if people reach out to us, we'll speak to them. And so we're kind of always seen as like the, as, as the founder, the investors that are in their corner and that's who we are. And that's who I think defines us as, as investors. I would also say, and I mentioned this earlier, having that kind of background in conflict resolution kind of comes with this skill set, right? Like you have the ability to, what I always think about is like, I'm always kind of putting myself in their, in their, in their position or like, what is it what is this person feeling right now? And, and how do I have a little bit more empathy going into this conversation? And, and so that it doesn't escalate, right? Like sometimes when you're investors in a conversation or where you're investors in a negotiation, things can escalate and it becomes a power dynamic, like a very weird skewed power, power dynamic very quickly, right? Like you're the person with money, they're the person that needs the money and it automatically can feel very onerous really quickly. And so I think having the background that I've had has really helped and kind of being even the per, the investor that sometimes founders will call me up in the middle of a negotiation with us and be like, can we just get on the phone because lawyer is getting involved or not helping the situation, right? And so I feel really proud about that because it makes it very human. And I think that's what I really want us to be known as, as investors is like very human investors that really, we give a shit about our founders. And as a result of that, we'll hear about problems that will crop up in a company before other investors do. Right. And I think as a result of that, that's actually our asset as an investor, we can help kind of troubleshoot and fix things before things get bad. Right. Because sometimes your founders are afraid to tell their investors that something's wrong or they're, they, they don't, because those investors are seen as very transactional. So I think our biggest asset is being those investors that aren't like that and and then and being able to be the ones that support them through the hard times. And and that that a lot of people tout being founder friendly and you know like Raj is going through this right I now. I was gonna ask, like, can I call can I call bullshit or not? Like no, please I'm, call bullshit. I'm sorry. Like, can I call bullshit? Yeah. Where's the reality of that? Call call some unfortunately, like I love you already, like. Let's do this, me and you. But like, <laughs> if I hear one more fucking time, oh, we love our founders. We're founder friendly. Blah, 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 blah. Here's a signed it's... term sheet. Oh no, actually, we're gonna pull it. Oh, bu- yeah, a hundred percent. Fuck you, not you. No, like, no, no. The reality. I, of I've seen it. Friend. I've yes, seen sure. it in negotiations. Right, I'll be like in a negotiation with other investors. And I will literally watch how they treat the founders and, or I'll watch like a term sheet get pulled or like, I'll see something happen to founders in their next round. Right. And I completely, I think that was Steph, what you were trying to get to with your next question is like, everyone says founder friendly. Right. And I was, we were, Miss and I were really mindful of that because we're like, dude, everyone says it. What does that even mean now? Right. Like, what does it mean to be founder friendly? Like, 
what it means is actually like, and that's what I always tell people. And like, whenever I talk to a, a company that we're looking to invest in, number one, what I say to them is that don't talk to us about what we do after the deal is done. Go talk to our founders, right? Go talk to the companies that we've invested in and actually figure out whether or not what we're saying is true. Number two, what I'll say to our companies when they go out and raise is go talk to the portfolio of that com of that investor and what do they say about those investors, right? Because exactly. that is really telling. And I say this also to like potential LPs, right? Like when we're speaking and pitching to investors, they were like, well, you know, every, like how, like, and I was like, please talk to our founders. Like we can tell you till we're blue in the face that we're founder friendly and why that's important. But like why it's important is actually like beyond the fact that our founders like we know, like, and I can say this really confidently, this is going to be out in the world. Like we, they love us as much as we love them. Right. Like we're in a, we're in a very, we're not in a transactional relationship. It is very collaborative with them and very much like this is a community that we're building. But what I think is really important, and I tell LPs this, it, it has helped us get into really competitive deals, right? Because some of the most, the most competitive deals in the market um, they're choosing between investors that could be the ones that pull the term sheet or treat you like shit in a negotiation, or maybe show up 45 minutes late to a call. Like, why would you do that? That's like such a weird power play, right? Like, and I always no, no, say no. like, answer that because we're founders. Why yeah. would you do that? Are we that, a, are you that busy? Are we that trivial to you? Is, you know, like, cause like you're giving us I insight could... to get the fuck out of here. Yeah. The only thing I could venture to guess is it is a power play, right? Like they're like, my time is more important than yours, or I am more important than you. That is a subliminal message, right? Even if they don't, if you say it to them after they're like, that's not what I was saying. I was just really late. And I'm like, you, by virtue of doing that, gave them this message, right? And that's why they don't want you on the turn on the cap table anymore, right? Which I don't blame them, right? And as someone who's been a founder myself, I'm like, I wouldn't want an investor that treated me that way, right? And it makes you just feel like shit. Like, why would you do that, right? And so for me, they do that because it is a power power dynamic. For me, for me as an investor, I actually feel, and maybe this is, I, you can call bullshit on this because I, I, you can just either believe me or you can talk to our founders about it and see if what I'm saying is true. But I genuinely believe that it is a privilege to be on someone's cap table. Like they, they, a lot of investors feel it's the other way. They're like, they should be so privileged that I'm giving them money. And then they're like, I'm like, dude, we have the easiest job in the world. I write you a check. I can help you after your business. But the hardest thing in the world to do is to build a business. Like our jobs as investors is like a fraction of how difficult that is. And if I get to be part of that journey, that is to me a privilege. So I will treat you with that respect. And that's how we, that's how we approach everything. But I can tell you for sure that a lot of investors don't behave that way, right? They, they see it the opposite, that it is, you have the privilege of their time and their money, and that's how they treat you. And I, I just don't agree with that. Right. And to the point of what you said to me earlier, Raj is like, how do you rec how do you like you know, when you're coming into a space that it is like that, how do you be different? And that is for me, like how I view that as different. And honestly, like I can say it, that it's not like, um, that it's not something that like, you know, I, I, I what I really truly believe is that I, I do believe that that's important for me, but it's also, we're not the only investors that are like that, right? Like I actually ha have an amazing community of other women, general partners of other investors that are really good friends of ours, where I've seen that modeled, right? Like one of my, one of my favorite people in the world is a mentor of mine, Chris Schroeder, shout out to Chris. He's been a mentor of mine for, you know, 10 years before I decided to start building a fund. He is one of the most empathetic investors I have ever met. Like, and he, he has taught me how to be a better investor, right? He asked questions about people's lives in the first conversation. Like he sometimes tells me stuff after a conversation. He's like, oh, did you hear that this person had an issue with her dad? I'm like, no. Like, and so I've had it modeled to me. I can't just say that Miss Bunner are acting in a vacuum. We actually have an amazing community community that we're learning from. And Ms. is a Kaufman fellow right now. She's learning from a community as well. And, and we're bringing that as well. But I definitely believe that we're not the only VCs that are like that. So, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of VCs that are not like that. And I also believe that there is a community of venture capital funds that really, truly operate from a place of empathy and really operate from a place of what I was just mentioning, where we feel like it is a privilege to be part of a, a founder's journey. I'm I'm so frustrated there are not more zeros at the end of your AUM because like because <laughs> no I'm serious because I hope maybe this I was like maybe it'll people like close the fund for us and maybe we can have more AUM in the no, future. No, let's let's <clears throat> let's call a spade a spade here. SVB went down. 
if you, you're a VC saying, okay, shit sucks, or you're, you're, I do I, and you're saying, cool, payroll's locked up, let's bridge you. But like something, the best fucking investor I have is an LP, he's an angel. And if I get on the phone with him once a week almost, and he's like, cool, like, did that work? You, it's such an interesting dynamic to speak to a, a an, an LP when shit didn't exactly pan out the way you thought it would. Yeah. But then he's immediately like, no, no, the vi- like he believes. So we talk through it and we get to the next iteration of it and it works. Mm-hmm. Point being, the ROI of his money is in a multiplier effect for not being a douchebag and mm-hmm. giving some empathy and being in the trenches. So the VCs have to see like candidly, literally, like you always like, it is truly an ROI multiplier to have some empathy. To, 100%. to listen to your founders and de-risk them, de-risk here, de-risk everything instead of being like, well, you suck. Yeah. So, thanks, question mark. Yeah. And that's what makes it so toxic, right? Like when you, that is the cycle, the hype cycle, that is like the herd mentality. All of those things to me are the parts of VC that I was like abhorrently not attracted to at all. And now I'm like, but then as I started to meet people, I'm like, wow, these people really inspire me. Like I would love to be a fraction of this investor. Like if I could be like, I, if I learning from Chris, I was like, if I could be a fraction of the type of investor he is one day, like I'm doing good. Right. And, and he's someone who's like, was investing in the middle East before other definitely before other white people were, but like, he just was like, believes in places, right? He believes in founders and yeah, I'm giving a lot of airtime to Chris, but like, he's taught me a lot. And I, and I really, really benefit, benefited from like being able to see that that was being mirrored. It wasn't something that we were just building from scratch, but that type of mentality can exist and can do well. And I think that's important. Convince me <laughs> as somebody yeah. who's, who's seen eye to eye and, and, you know, at one point um, was also in the space, but the founder friendly tag after knowing some of your portfolio companies as well, it definitely does apply. And yeah, it's a huge testament to what you built. So very, kudos you. to you and your team. And, and, um, yeah, coming from a founder, like just listen, not the VC side from a founder side, like, yes, we are heard and validated and we're heard and validated from you. And like everybody would. We yeah. need more. Well, a lot more of that. Wow. So we like to end most episodes usually just asking about like your ideal founder fit. So we know you're a GP, assuming your your fund is focusing mainly on Pakistan, but as being part of different ecosystems and, and being a, a valuable resource for founders of wherever they're from, like what kind of founders do you enjoy just interacting with, meeting with, or, or helping? And if possible, just a little bit more context, because uh, Seth is right. Like, I love this. And I love, like, I know founders right now who are listening or whatnot, or investors, LPs, like, man, when's fund two coming? When's fund three? Like, <laughs> what's big picture for you guys before, you know, getting into who you want to work with? I, I love the accelerator model. Are you guys going to bring that back in any way? Mm-hmm. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. What's the that's... big picture? Yeah, the sister company is going to be launching something called iDi Scale soon. That's going to be more geared towards companies that are scaling and growing and wanting to grow to new markets, which in Pakistan right now, given the current market conditions, like being able to, to grow to like the Middle East or growing to the regions, I think is going to be really important. So that's what they're up to right now, amongst other really amazing, exciting things from a founder perspective of what we look for. And I think it's mirroring, right? Like I think Ms. Ba and I look for people that, number one, I think it's interesting because by being women investors and most of the people that pitch to us are men, that we definitely have women in our portfolio which who are really proud of. And as women, we want the diversity. Um, I think it's interesting. It automatically weeds out a lot of douchebags. A lot of douchebags don't want to be told what to do by women, right? So we just Fuck don't. Yeah. Yeah, we just don't get a lot of people pitching to us, to be honest with you, that are it, people that self-select in or people that are like, we just want you on our cap table, not no, like, awesome. I don't know if I want to get take orders from women, right? Like those are people automatically that have sifted out. I would say that overall, the thread that we see is like an overwhelming sense of curiosity. Like I think people that are deeply curious and that's something that Ms. Ben and I really hold valuable about ourselves. Like I, that is one of my biggest things that I look for in other people. I'm like, are you a curious human being? 
being, because for me, that means that you're constantly going to be asking questions, but you're also going to be listening as well a lot. Because if you're just a curious person, if you're not curious to me, if you're going to be just talking all the time, right? And so that curiosity is something that we find is a really in- integral and intrinsic, like, characteristic of all of our founders, a sense of humility, because knowing what you don't know is like the biggest asset as a founder so that you know how to like build your team. And then the third thing that I would say is that sense of grit, right? Which Angela Duckworth talks about grit is the confluence of passion and determination. And in Pakistan, you typically have that anyway, if you're building a company, but you, it really shows in the hardest times. And I think Ms. when I've said this a lot, 2021 was a year in Box Sun where so much money was flowing into, so much capital was flowing into startups that literally like you could have just said, I'm building X, like Uber for whatever, not even have a business model. And people would have written you a check that would have gotten to you in like 24 hours. Right. And I think now what we're seeing, because we're kind of back in the scarcity mode of capital being a lot harder to, to achieve and to, uh, to get, now you're really seeing the, the really good founders, like who's there to really execute, right? And I think this is where Ms. and I were saying that we've been the most inspired this past year, 2022, and now this year of how the, that this is where real grit is, right? Of like people that are really there to build and not there to just raise money and to have headlines, right? And I think that's like, you know, the founders that we've had in our portfolio, like, like the credit book guys is an example. It's like they were Tiger's first check in Pakistan. They could have ridden that PR wave forever, but they actually literally the minute the, the PR came out, they're like, all right, peace. We're going to go build for a while because uh, we got to monetize the shit and like build a build a business that can grow and, and work. And not only have they built a, a really incredible company, they've built a company that has a culture where people love going to work. Like Ms. Ben, I did a talk at the credit book office and it was just kind of amazing. I'm like, wow, these like people love this company. Right. And to do that in a company like box in a country like Pakistan, where there's a lot of like toxic work environments to me was so cool. And we see that with like, you know, we were talking about swag kicks earlier. That's our most recent investment that we just announced that I love that I've known those founders for so long and that I've seen the trajectory of their journeys and to now see it, it's like that, that hustle, that grit of what they've built with nothing was like amazing to me. And they don't come from like, they're not kids that went abroad to university, right? They like built, they're from Pakistan and went to school in Pakistan. And I love that. So yeah, I think those three characteristics are across the board in our founders. And then you can kind of see it manifest in different ways. But I think for the most part, those are the things that we look for. And and, and we see it a lot. It kind of, I can get it really quickly because I ran a program for so long. I've seen hundreds of companies at this point. I can kind of get a really good gut check on a founder really, really quickly. And, and then as we get to know them, we can kind of see how they operate. But th- those are the things that we look for. Thank you so much, Kosum. So Raj usually likes to end uh, with a with a question. Go for it, bro. So I always find it interesting. Guy Raz, how I built this. Love the guy. Yeah. Uh, Percentage wise, April 19th, 2023. You got here. Percentage of luck, percentage of hard work. Oh my gosh. I would say 80% hard work, 20% luck. Like it. Yeah. I do think that, like, I, the one thing, and, and Seth, you mentioned this earlier, and I thank you for saying that. We're, I've, consistency is probably like my best character trait. Like, I will always work really, really hard. I was like that even in school. My mom always said, like, if I never, if I wasn't naturally good at something, I would work extremely hard to be as good as the person um, that was naturally good at it, right? Even if I never fully got there. And I've always had a very, very good work ethic. Um, and then luck, obviously, right? Like I also named that I come from privilege. I have, you know, my, I was lucky to go to some of the best schools. Like, so I was in the right place at the right time in so many parts of my life. So it's not like I, it was just hard work that got me here and not network and not privilege and all of those things. So I definitely have to name that. Well, hey, Kulsum, thank you so much. We like to end, uh, each episode with just offering flowers and, for me personally, right? So you've been a tremendous inspiration from the beginning, from the accelerator days, from the community days, as somebody who, even when I was trying to build a VC and an accelerator in Pakistan, it always came back to, okay, the the number one program, right? After having research and, and 
coming up with well in a in a country like Pakistan again where you get a lot of people who try to do good or or claim to be doing good but you know they have an ulterior motive and I2I was always one of those organizations which I kept coming back to as you know it doesn't matter whatever is happening out in the market they keep they keep staying true to their values and I've seen Thank that you. happen now for the last 10 years I'm a huge fan of your fund actually uh, so Ali co-founder of Abhi very close friend of mine he was part okay. of planet n actually at planet n i was the one who brought him into the fund over there so ah, and then we cool. both we both left planet n around the same time he knows kind of the background about like so the year that i was in pakistan so afterwards there was a, a brief period where i was trying to start a fund and was in talks with a few people but i kept telling him like man i wish i could join i just then it's like you know like you and Ms. Bai, i've only met Ms. Bai a handful of times but she's I can tell she's, she's a, also amazing. She's a rock star. Yeah. yeah. She makes me better every day. So yeah. But huge testament to you and your team and for continually driving, you know, the conversation forward and, and just doing good. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you for me personally for being an inspiration. And yeah, best of luck with with fun one and and everything in the future. Thank you. Okay. Well, hey, Nelson, thank thanks you. for thank yeah. you so much. And thanks, to our guys. viewers. Thank you so much again for joining us. Real quick, just to plug in our, our concierge. So as an ex-VC, as, a, as founders, myself and Raj do offer free 20-minute conversations with any founder. If they want to deal with in a private confidential space, deal, uh, ask about uh, challenges that they're facing, and then to get insight or connections through us to solve them. Um, so definitely please check that out. But otherwise, uh, we'll join you again next week for a brand new episode. Thank you. Thanks, guys.